Matthew chapter 1 for our scripture. Thank you for blessing us in the song. Aren't you glad that God walks with us through every circumstance of life? Through those times of crises, those valleys that we walk through. And sometimes we get so focused upon what is happening that maybe we don't recognize that God is there. He's at work. He provides whatever we need for the circumstance. And we are sufficient for life. Because of him, not because of ourselves. Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to continue the message I began on last Sunday as we think about the mission of the Savior, or maybe a subtitle, When God Visited His World. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God visited this world. We just celebrated Christmas and by most people, the greatest focus has been upon gifts and upon giving gifts. But the greatest gift ever given was the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world to be our Savior. <clears throat> At Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' birth. At Easter, we celebrate his death. But are you aware of the magnitude of that gift? And are we aware of the extent that our Lord has gone to in providing our salvation? It was planned before there ever was a world or before God ever created humanity. And all down through the ages of time, God kept the way open through which Jesus Christ would come into this world. And so Jesus Christ, our Savior, left heaven and came to this world on a mission. And that mission was to go to Calvary and die for the sin of the world, and provide our salvation. And so I want us to think about Jesus' visit to this earth, and the transition that he went through in coming from heaven to earth. Last Sunday we looked at the fact that Jesus came from a perfect heaven to a sin-filled world. We look about us today and see all that is happening and we're shocked at all the, the sin and all that's going on just around us is what we see. But our Lord sees the whole universe. But Jesus came from a perfect heaven to visit a sin-filled world. But then Jesus came from light to darkness. Heaven is a place of light, but Jesus came to a place where the darkness of sin is ruling and reigning. And then Jesus came from a place of worship and of <coughs> praise to a place of cursing and swearing and blasphemy. And so we'll pick up from there uh, on our thoughts today. Christ came from perfect peace to unrest. Did you know that heaven is a place of perfect, perfect peace? And we really don't know about that because we're in a world of conflict. But in heaven, there are no wars. There is no conflict. There are no weapons of wars, no violence, no crime, no jails. 
no prisons, no rehabilitation, no jealousy, no rivalry, no seeking superiority. There is no hate. In heaven, it's a place of peace and joy and harmony. And that's the place that we're headed for one of these days. And yet Jesus came into a world of conflict and of chaos. The Jews were under Roman rule. Jesus was born into this world into a family that was in the bondage of Rome. And everywhere Jesus looked, there were Roman soldiers. There was oppression. There was political unrest. There were family disputes, brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor. And here was the Prince of Peace, born in the midst, into the midst of conflict. When Jesus claimed to be king, they said, that's treason. But the greatest conflict in this world, both then and now, is in the hearts of humanity. You see, the peace of God does not rule in the heart of the unsaved person. Because people do not know the peace of God in their hearts. When a person receives Jesus Christ as Savior, the war is over. There comes a peace into the heart that passes all understanding. And a calm comes into the heart of, the, of a person when Jesus says, peace, be still. Sins are forgiven. Guilt is gone. Conscience is clear. Hope uh, replaces despair. Death gives way to life. And Satan, the author of conflict, is cast out of uh, rule in our life. And the Prince of Peace comes to live in our heart as a believer. When Jesus was born in this world, the angels proclaimed peace on earth and goodwill toward men. But until the Prince of Peace comes into the heart of an unbeliever, there will be no peace in that heart. There will be no peace uh, in the church. There will be no peace in this world until the Prince of Peace touches our society and our lives. And so Jesus came from perfect peace to a world of conflict. And then Jesus came from perfect love to hate. In heaven, agape love, God's love, reigns. Perfect love reigns in heaven. And, and God is the embodiment of love. Love originates in God. Someone said that love does not define God, but God defines love. God's love is a holy love. And his holiness and his righteousness and his judgments are expressed in love. Everything God does, he does because he is a God of love. And sometimes when God maybe uh, intervenes in our lives, we think, in fact, Satan comes along and he said, God doesn't love you. If he did, why, this wouldn't be happening in your life. And yet, uh, all that God does, he does out of love. God is love. And God never changes. And many of those things that happen in our life, uh, we don't see the good maybe now. We may not even see it in this world. But the Bible said all things work together for the good of them that love God, for them who are called according to his purpose. And so love that comes from the very essence of God is a, is a holy love. It, it is a spiritual love. But Jesus came to a world that was full of hate and animosity and jealousy. But Jesus was a very embodiment of love. And he came to a hate-filled world. But Jesus came 
as the very embodiment of love. He showed love wherever he went. He showed love in all that he did. But Jesus brought God's love to this world. He came to this world to show God's love. Because of love, our sins are forgiven. We deserve punishment, but he forgives our sins. Because of love, he gives us life where we were dead in trespasses and sins. As Jesus walked upon this earth, he demonstrated his love. He returned love for hate. But then Jesus came to this world to share his love. Every person who receives Jesus Christ is born of love. If you don't love, then you're not born of God. God's love is manifest in our hearts. And we show that love through the life we live and our relationships with others. Romans 5 and 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which he has given us. This verse says that God's love is poured out into our hearts as believers. And so love is a part of our nature. It is a part of who we are as believers. God is love. And you and I are people who love God, who love our friends and our family, but we love even those who don't love us. And folks, only the love of God and only God can enable us to love those who are maybe our enemies. But Jesus came to this world as an expression of God's love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jesus came from a place of perfect love to a place of hate and chaos. But then Jesus came from power to weakness. The scripture says there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. And the Bible talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. Our God is all powerful. God created this world out of nothing. Everything that uh, is in this world, in this universe, is God's creation. God gave order to this world. He created all life. And today, God still controls this universe. God hasn't lost control. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. He's the one who holds this thing together. And God has power, all power, power over life and power over death. He has power over the physical and over the spiritual. Jesus Christ, our Savior, was instrumental in the creation. The Bible says all things were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1 and 16 says, For by him that is by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And so Jesus Christ, our Savior, is all-powerful God, and yet Jesus laid aside his mighty power and became a weak baby. In that manger was a tiny, helpless baby that had to be cared for by another. Jesus grew to manhood, and there were times when Jesus demonstrated his power. There were times when Jesus he went about healing the sick, raising the dead, making the blind to see, 
He calmed the winds and the seas. He fed the multitudes. But basically, Jesus chose weakness. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, I could call and God would send 12 legions of angels to deliver him. But he did not. As he hung on the cross, the crowd mocked Jesus and they were saying, if he be the son of God, let him come down from the cross. And he could have, but he did not. Jesus chose weakness. And he chose to die on the cross of Calvary for the sin of the world. This world, this wicked world that did not, does not recognize the mighty power of God. Those around that cross as Jesus was being crucified were at the mercy and the grace of God because with one word, he could have destroyed them all. But Jesus chose weakness. But then when he arose from the grave, he arose in power. God is not weak today. He's on his throne. And uh, God has all power in heaven and in earth. He has resurrection power, the power over life and death. And God is not, God is not weak. Uh, the world thinks God is uh, going on vacation somewhere, but God is going to intervene in the world affairs in his own time. But then Jesus came from a place of perfect obedience to a place of rebellion. Did you know that in heaven God's will is done? Every command, every desire, every wish of God is carried out completely. Every angel, every living creature in heaven uh, is in perfect obedience to God. When God says go, they go. When God says come, they come. And so there is perfect obedience in heaven but Jesus came to a world of rebellion. In heaven, when Jesus said to one of the angels, go, God used the angels. They went, they obeyed. But Jesus came to this world and he saw and experienced the disobedience, the disregard, the disrespect for his word and his will. Everywhere Jesus looked, there was rebellion, and surely this broke the heart of our Lord and Savior. Jesus wept over humanity's rebellion because he knew that it led to destruction. And folks, but for God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and God's long-suffering, Jesus would have poured out his wrath upon this world and one day he will because of sin and disobedience God is long suffering he's not willing that any should perish but there is a limit there is a deadline and I fear that maybe America may have already crossed God's deadline God is a God of love but that love goes so far. Of course, whatever God does, he does from love. But then Jesus came from a spiritual being to a physical being. Did you know that God is spirit? He is not materialistic. God is not tangible. He is not limited by the material. God does not have a material body. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, God revealed himself in a cloud, in smoke, in fire, in human form. And yes, God spoke audibly. He performed miracles. God guided the events of history. But God is spiritual. And as such, God is not limited. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere present. God is immutable. He's unchanging. He is infinite without uh, beginning or end. 
But Jesus stepped out of this spiritual realm and came into this world. He took the limitations of a human body. As an infant, Jesus was a weak baby. He was nursed and cared for by another. As a boy, the scripture says he grew in wisdom and stature uh, and in favor with God and man. He took the limitations of knowledge. When Jesus took a human body, he laid aside his radiant glory. He laid aside his mighty power. He laid aside his unlimited knowledge, his unlimited presence. Jesus could only be in one place at a time. Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus took limitations when he came into this world, when he took a human body. And my, what a change this must have been for he who is God. And yet Jesus took a body that he might die on the cross of Calvary and become the sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus took a human body, tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And in that body, he went to the cross of Calvary and paid our sin debt. Jesus came from uh, that spirit to a, the limitations of a human body. And then Christ came, Jesus came from life to death. God is life. He not only gives life, but God is life. In heaven, life reigns. In heaven, did you know that nothing fades? Nothing loses its luster. There's no death in heaven. There's no aging, no weakness, no deterioration, no sickness, no death. The tree of life never fades. It never dies. There is no fall season in heaven. It's always springtime in heaven. The angels live eternally. They never die. In heaven, the saints of God live eternally. Uh, and we're never going to die because we have eternal life. But here on earth, every living thing has its source in God. God made every living creature. He gave life to every plant, uh, every herb. And God breathed into man's nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so God is life. But Jesus came to this world to a place of death. Every human being is under the sentence of death because it is appointed that a man wants to die. But when Jesus came to this world, everywhere he looked, he saw the symptoms of death. There was sickness and pain. There were cripples. There was aging. The symptoms of death. But greatest of all, Jesus saw all of humanity dead in trespasses and sins. And this fact is what brought Jesus into this world. He who is alive came to this world to die. He came to conquer death. And when Jesus died on that cross, he tasted death for every person. Jesus died our death. And he arose from the grave, and when he did, he conquered death. He broke the power of death. Jesus walked through that valley, that shadow that each of us must walk, and he's expelled the horrors and the fears of the valley and the shadow of death. And, and I know that we're all human, but you don't have to dread or fear death 
Because Jesus has walked before us. And he's died our death. We have eternal, everlasting life. Because you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, you already have eternal life. Uh, you know, some people think, well, when I die, I'm going to have eternal life. No, we have eternal life right now because we've trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And I'm going to live forever. And you will live forever. Yes, we'll walk through that valley. We'll lay down this body, this house where the real person lives. And this body is just a house where the real person lives forever. How many years God allows us to stay here. When we leave this world, we're going to that place where there is no death. Amen. Yeah. Folks, this is why Jesus left heaven and came into this world. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So really, every person is either dead in trespasses and sins or you have a living Christ. In you. Our new birth gives us his life, which is eternal. Let me just say in conclusion that Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth to make earth like heaven. In the model prayer, Jesus said, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's God's desire. Jesus came from heaven to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you know him as your Savior today? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Jesus came for that reason. He has gone to the cross. He has paid our sin debt. He has made salvation possible to whosoever will and God loves you whomever you are, wherever you are in your journey of life God loves you and he wants to be your savior he wants to be a part of your life have you trusted him as your savior, have you come to that point where you said God I know I'm a sinner but I confess my sin I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I believe Jesus is God the Son who came to this world, who went to that cross and paid my sin debt. And I ask you to forgive my sin. Come in my life and be my Savior. And you will. If you've not done that, would you do it today? Let's pray. Lord, we're amazed at how much you love us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You did not wait for us to become worthy because we could never become worthy. But thank you, Lord, that you saw us as sinful, as unworthy, and yet you gave your son. Lord Jesus, you gave your life on that cross that we might have your life, which is eternal, which is abundant. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for salvation that's available to whosoever will. In Jesus' name.